On World News Tonight, Freedom Day. Sydney finally reopens the doors to the public as Australia looks to live with COVID-19. Riot revealing. Details revealed on what was happening inside the White House during the January 6th riots. Continuing conflict. China and Taiwan in a fierce tug of war with growing high stakes tensions. Celebrating culture. India brightens up with colour to please their goddess with traditional dancers. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with updates on the COVID pandemic. Sydney's cafes, gyms and restaurants welcome back fully vaccinated customers today after nearly four months of lockdown as Australia aims to begin living with the coronavirus and gradually reopening the country. For more on this, we have other there in a World News special correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, I'm Ravi. Calling it Freedom Day, New South Wales State Premier Dominic Perotet told reporters in Sydney the state needs to learn to live alongside the virus. Gyms, pubs, restaurants and retail are only open to people who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Perotet warned that infections would rise after reopening and virus-free states such as Western Australia and Queensland are watching what living with COVID-19 is going to look like amid concerns health systems could be overwhelmed. Perotet has declared an end to lockdowns in New South Wales and has strong support for reopening in Sydney, whose more than 5 million residents endured severe restrictions from mid-June following an outbreak of the highly infectious Delta variant. Owners of restaurants and other public venues are now scrambling to arrange supplies and staffing. Many social distancing restrictions, however, and limits on public gathering will remain for weeks. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News special correspondent, Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia. Meanwhile, in Rome, police and demonstrators clashed over an imminent requirement for workers in Italy to have a Green Pass certificate to prove that they have been either vaccinated, tested negative or recovered from COVID-19. Violence over the vaccine in the heart of Rome. What started off as a restless yet peaceful protest sparked a tinderbox as demonstrators stormed the headquarters of Italy's biggest trade union. Some were neo-fascists. As they marched toward the prime minister's office, police fired water cannons and tear gas. All of it for freedom, they shout, freedom from a national vaccine mandate. Starting next weekend, Italians are required to show proof of vaccination, recovery, or a negative COVID test in order to enter the workplace, the strictest such law in the world. Impassioned but minority voices. Polls show most Italians believe the new rules help ensure the hell of last year never happens again. When they ran out of space to bury the dead. We have some good news for you. Down a dusty farm track in Chilean wine country, forestry experts are nursing a plantation of saplings whose barks hold the promise of potent vaccines. Here in the dusty Casablanca region of Chilean wine country lies what could be the key natural resource behind a new COVID-19 vaccine for low- and middle-income countries, the bark of the kie trees. Long used by the indigenous Mapuche people to make soap and medicine, the trees have been used to make a highly successful vaccine against shingles and the world's first malaria vaccine. Now, two molecules made from the bark of branches pruned from older trees in Chile's forests are being used for a COVID-19 vaccine developed by Maryland-based Novavax. The chemicals are used to make a substance that boosts the immune system. Over the next two years, Novavax plans to produce billions of doses of the vaccine, mostly for low- and middle-income countries, which would make it one of the largest COVID-19 vaccine suppliers in the world. With no reliable data on how many healthy kie trees are left in Chile, experts and industry officials are divided on how quickly the supply of older trees will be depleted by rising demand. 
but nearly everyone agrees that industries relying on kiei extracts will at some point need to switch to plantation-grown trees or a lab-grown alternative. My estimate maybe four years ago was that we were heading towards the, the sustainability limit of, of cutting limbs. Ricardo San Martín, who developed the pruning and extraction process that created the modern Kie industry, said producers must immediately work toward making Kie products from younger plantation-grown trees. Kie producers and their customers say the harvest can continue for now without decimating the supply of older trees. Andres González, the manager of Desert King International, Novavax's sole supplier of Kiei extracts, told it is set to produce enough Kiei extract from older trees to make up to 4.4 billion vaccine doses in 2022. A relatively small volume of Kiei extract is required to make vaccines, just under 1 milligram per dose, but the supply is stretched by the demand from other industries. While some have expressed confidence in the producer's ability to manage supply and demand, there are concerns about other threats, like drought and fire. Now on to the fight to get Trump insiders to testify before the January 6th Commission. Members of Congress are not threatening criminal penalties for those who refuse to comply with subpoenas. And sources revealed exclusive new information on what was going on inside the White House as insurrectionists stormed the Capitol. What was Donald Trump doing at the White House as his supporters attacked the U.S. Capitol building? The decision by President Biden to turn over confidential White House documents to the House Committee investigating January 6th may shed light into what Trump, his aides, and members of his family were up to. One thing certain to be of interest to the committee is related to the controversial video Trump released more than two hours after the Capitol was breached. Trump told his supporters to go home, but he also praised them. We love you. You're very special. In reporting for my upcoming book, Betrayal, the final act of the Trump show, sources told me that Trump recorded multiple takes of that video that were deemed unacceptable by his aides because he praised the rioters, but he didn't tell them to go home. Those outtakes, I'm told, were videotaped by White House photographers and our government property and would provide insight into Trump's state of mind on that day. Trump has vowed to fight to keep such documents secret, citing executive privilege. Biden disagrees. He believes it to be of the utmost importance for both Congress and the American people to have a complete understanding uh, of the events of that day to prevent them from happening again. In reporting for Betrayal, I spoke to several people who were in contact with Trump during the riot. Trump, the sources say, was watching TV in his private dining room. He liked what he saw. He boasted about the size of the crowd, and he argued with aides who wanted him to call on his supporters to stop rioting. The book reveals more details about Kevin McCarthy's call to Trump as the rioters stormed the House chamber. According to a source familiar with the call, McCarthy, frustrated at Trump's indifference to what was happening, said, I just got evacuated from the Capitol. There were shots fired right off the House floor. You need to make this stop. The source said Trump pushed back, saying, quote, they are just more upset than you because they believe it more than you, Kevin, referring to the lie that the election had been stolen. Still in the U.S., Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that it will be lawmakers' responsibility to raise a federal debt limit and expressed confidence that Congress would do so after temporary review runs out on December 3rd. It is imperative. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said on Sunday that she was confident Congress would raise the debt ceiling after a temporary increase runs out on December 3rd, saying not doing so would be, quote, completely irresponsible and a self-inflicted wound. Yellen called raising the debt limit a housekeeping chore for lawmakers and said it was simply their responsibility to pay the bills that resulted from past decisions they made referring to roughly $8 trillion in spending Republican lawmakers had backed during Donald Trump's presidency. Last week, the Senate approved a short-term fix after a lengthy partisan standoff on Friday, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell wrote in a letter to President Joe Biden that he would not help Democrats again in raising the debt limit. But Yellen said she was confident that Congress's Democratic leaders, quote, will be able to manage this so we don't face this situation. She ruled out invoking the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which says the validity of U.S. public debt shall not be questioned. Some Democrats have argued that that could be used to invalidate the debt ceiling, but it would entail a legal fight that would likely go to the Supreme Court. 
Meanwhile, congressional Democrats are working on Biden's sweeping social spending bill, but have yet to agree on the size of the multi-trillion dollar package. Yellen also said she was confident that the 15 percent global minimum tax rate agreed to by more than 130 countries last week would be included in that spending bill and that she hoped Congress would pass it. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen responded defiantly to President Xi Jinping's vow to reunify with China, saying the island will not be forced to bow to China and will bolster military defenses. Tensions reached historic highs in the past week when China sent nearly 150 warplanes into Taiwan's air defense zone. Taiwan marked its national day with flags, fanfare and defiance. The island's president, Tsai Ing-wen, vowing Taiwan will not be forced to bow to China. Taiwan is standing on the front line of defending democracy, she said. China has long viewed Taiwan as its own national territory. China's President Xi Jinping on Saturday all but declaring a policy. The complete reunification of our country must be and will be realized, he said. China has been pushing that point and tension to historic new highs. In the past week, sending nearly 150 warplanes into Taiwan's air defense zone, forcing Taiwan's fighter jets to scramble, missile systems to deploy. At some point, there's going to be a miscalculation. Uh, and that would be dangerous for the entire region. U.S. officials say they're concerned by all the provocation here and warn China against hostile pressure. Officially, the U.S. doesn't take sides in the dispute over Taiwan, but just approved a $750 million arms sale to the island. There are reports of training, too, with American troops, including a special operations unit and U.S. Marines said to be stationed on Taiwan for over a year. Germany's outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel held talks with Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in a final official visit to the country after 16 years in power. For more on this, we have other there in a World News special correspondent Inuko Ponzo reporting now from Cleve in Germany. Yes, Anuradi. This is Merkel's eighth visit to Israel since taking office in 2005. The German Chancellor had planned to conduct the visit in late August but cancelled it citing the tense situation in Afghanistan as the United States, Germany and others evacuated personnel ahead of an August 31st deadline for the withdrawal of foreign troops. Merkel said that Germany remains committed to reviving the international nuclear agreement with Iran, a step Israel vehemently opposes. She also said Germany believes a two-state solution remains the best way to end Israel's decade-long conflict with the Palestinians. Moreover, she also said Israel's settlement construction on occupied territories sought by the Palestinians was unhelpful. Following an inconclusive September 26 election, Germany's Social Democrats are currently courting smaller parties to form a coalition that will replace a conservative group led by Merkel's Christian Democrats. Merkel plans to step down once a new government is formed. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other there in a World News special correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. More than 100,000 polls demonstrated in support of a European Union membership after a court ruling that parts of EU law are incompatible with the Constitution. Hundreds of thousands of demonstrators in Poland flocked to city streets on Sunday, rallying to remain in the European Union. It came after a court ruled parts of EU law are not aligned with the country's constitution, stoking fears it may leave the bloc. Organizers say nearly 100,000 people gathered in the capital Warsaw alone, waving Polish and EU flags and shouting, we are staying. One protester pointed to the UK's exit from the EU as an example of what might happen. Poland's right-wing ruling Law and Justice Party has increasingly been at odds with the European Commission over issues like LGBT plus rights and judicial independence. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki welcomed the court ruling on Thursday, adding the EU must respect each member state. Opposition leader Donald Tusk spoke in front of Warsaw's royal castle on Sunday and suggested, quote, We know why they want to leave the EU, so that they can violate democratic rules with impunity. Morawiecki's party says it has no plans for a poll exit. 
As the Taliban started issuing travel documents to citizens, crowds of Afghans flocked the passport office in Kabul, scrambling to get their documents. Crowds of people gathered outside Afghanistan's Kabul passport office on Sunday morning, desperate to get travel documents. Taliban authorities began issuing passports to citizens again early last week, following months of delays that hampered efforts of those trying to flee the country after the Islamist group seized control in August. Taliban security officials tried to keep order as applicants became frustrated with the chaos. Uh, this man said passport office officials announced they would distribute some 25,000 passports to the people. He started queuing for his at 4 a.m. and said there has been a lack of order and discipline. The Taliban's interior ministry spokesman said last week that those thousands of applicants had reached the final stage of paying for passports and that roughly 100,000 applications were pending. Poverty and hunger have worsened since the Islamist movement took over Afghanistan. The United Nations also says half a million people have been displaced in recent months, adding that the number will only grow if health services, schools and the economy break down. Welcome back and for more world news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is reportedly considering a visit to the Fukushima nuclear power plant next Sunday. And if he does go, Japan and its neighbours, including Korea, will be paying close attention to what he says about plans to release the radioactive water stored at the plant into the ocean. After a total blackout across Lebanon, power supplies were partially restored a day later. The country has been paralysed by an economic and energy crisis that has only deepened as supplies of import fuel have dried up. In Ramon Crater in the desert of southern Israel, a team of six, five men and one woman have begun simulating what it will be like to live for about a month on Mars. Animal lovers in Lima had their pets blessed during a special Mass for their four-legged friends and other pets at the St. Francis Monastery. Hundreds of migrants and refugees waited outside the United Nations Center in Tripoli to seek help in escaping Libya after what aid groups call a violent crackdown in which thousands were arrested and several shot. The OECD announced that more than 130 countries have signed up to a new minimum corporate tax deal starting 2023. The new measure is likely to apply to some major South Korean companies as well, including Samsung Electronics. The OECD announced that a total of 136 countries has agreed to enforce a corporate tax rate of at least 15 percent and require companies to pay taxes in the countries where they do business. It said the deal includes all members of the OECD, G20 and EU. The minimum tax rate would apply to overseas profits of global firms with sales of more than 750 million euros, or about 868 million US dollars. The Paris-based organization said this would have countries collect around 150 billion US dollars in new revenues annually. The deal also shifts the right to tax companies from their home countries to nations where they earn significant profits, even without a physical presence there. It allows countries where revenues are earned to tax 25% of the multinational's excess profit, defined as profits above 10% of their revenue. The measure applies to firms with profit margins above 10% and global sales exceeding 20 billion euros or around 23 billion US dollars. This will include Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix based in South Korea. Both Samsung and SK said that they are keeping a close eye on the deal's implementation. Industry watchers in Korea say that it's unlikely the two companies will be severely affected because even though they will have to pay tax in more countries instead of just their home country, the total amount of tax will not change much. But there will be more cost in getting the taxes done as they have to report and pay a new form of tax once the deal is implemented. Friday's deal follows concerns that large multinationals are rerouting their profits through low-tax jurisdictions to cut their bills. A statement released by the OECD said the affected companies include American digital giants such as Google, Amazon and Facebook. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said on Twitter that the deal represents a quote, once-in-a-generation accomplishment for economic diplomacy. And finally tonight, women in India's western Gujarat state balanced brass spots on their heads as they danced in coordination movements in circles to thank and please Hindu goddess Umaya. 
Devotees believe that whatever they ask for with a pure heart, the goddess fulfills their wish and in turn to please her, they dance with this ritual near her temple. Goddess Amaya is the clan deity of a regional agrarian and landlord caste in Gujarat. Hindus in India are celebrating the nine-day Navaratri festival dedicated to worshipping the warrior goddess Durga and her various forms and incarnations. During the festival, Hindus observe fast, refrain from taking alcohol, meat, onion and garlic in food. They dress up in colourful dresses and dance in groups after sunset. The festivities culminate on the 10th day with the killing of buffalo demon Mahia Shur. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Chanal will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.